West Coast gold miner in the 1860s. Born in Australia, but this good keen man was now here in the New Zealand bush, prospecting for his fortune and maybe fame. And he did it, but not in the way you might expect. The Reverend Paul Fairclough, FRAS, was to become one of New Zealand Methodism's most able ministers. Last week we looked at the redoubtable Reverend Daniel Dutton. He was the primitive Methodist who went on to climb to the top of the Presbyterian ladder. Fairclough's appeal, like Dutton's, is not the result of a straightforward emphasis on Christian faith alone. It appears as a result of science illuminating faith. The gold that Fairclough found was the golden light of science and geometry. Dutton and Fairclough were from the two main sides to New Zealand Methodism, the Wesleyans and the Primitives. But they were united in the love of one particular subject, astronomy. Fairclough was not an outstanding preacher or evangelist in the church's life and witness. However, he had qualities of leadership and administration, and he had the capacity for individual independent thought. So it was a rare combination of talents, and when combined with his faith, it's true to say he lived in New Zealand under geometry's golden sun. He was a lucid expositor on matters scientific, and it was for this he won widespread, widespread respect. In 1871, Fairclough candidated for the ministry of the Wesleyan Connection. He was placed in pre-collegiate training under the tutelage of A.R. Fitchett at that time in Christchurch. A.R. Fitchett we've also looked at in a previous video. Sometimes, once in a blue moon, a student finds a tutor, a teacher, who changes everything. Think of the already wise Nicodemus, who came in the dead of night to seek Jesus, rabbi, teacher. And think of the Greek philosophers. It happens more in the church than in the academy, but it's still rare. Why is this? It's often the case in Christian families that great care is taken to pass on the faith from one generation to the next. And this was particularly so in the small denominations of colonial New Zealand. Much emphasis was laid upon this responsibility of creating the family church, and indeed continues to be so. Some clergy relish the awe and wonder that comes with reverence for nature, uh, a Franciscan delight in brother, son and sister moon, a canticle of spirituality which simply had to find its voice, and find its voice it did as various clergy came to see that their Christian faith and modern science were different ways of expressing this abiding spirituality. For them it came as naturally to teach as Greek or Hebrew or the history of Christian thought and ideas. But even more, it expanded Christianity immeasurably. Thus Fitchett trained Fairclough and Fairclough later on trained Pinfold in the canticle of scientific and mathematical delight. They lived under Brother Sun's golden light of geometry and mathematical wonders. Let's listen to what Fitchett said about his ministry student. In 1872, he reported that Fairclough, quote, has been under my tuition since December last, unquote. And during that time, not only had the initial exercises in Latin and Greek been done, but also a good deal of algebra to cubic equations and the first six books of Euclid. The candidate for ministry was obliged to undergo a rigorous test to see what progress he'd made. Fitchett and Reverend W.J. Habens examined Fairclough. They found he was very good at parsing, provided accurate literal translations, had mastered Euclidean geometry, but was inclined to make elementary ar arithmetical mistakes. Uh, consequently, they recommended that he be sent to college for further training, which was to be at Newington College, Sydney. So let's jump forward to when he was much older. It was then that Fairclough attempted to communicate his love of science to younger ministers. Reverend J.T. Pinfold recalled that Fairclough's interest in science was, quote, a great inspiration in those early days, unquote. Fairclough lent Pinfold a book that, quote, light might be obtained upon the meaning of the first chapter of Genesis, unquote. 
was, of course, all about astronomy and geology. Fairclough wrote extensively on astronomy for the general newspapers as well as editing the Methodist Church newspaper for some six years. Eventually, in 1897, he was elected to the office of the President of the Methodist Church of New Zealand, but still found time for science. 1910, Fairclough, Roseby and Dutton were prime movers in the formation of the Dunedin Astronomical Society. No doubt their cause was greatly assisted by the publicity prior to the appearance of Halley's Comet. The younger generation were not taking up the cause of science with the same enthusiasm as many of their predecessors. And the first hint of this break came from both the Methodists and the Presbyterians jointly. Traditionally, they maintained emphases on a learned ministry familiar with philosophy, logic and natural science, but in 1895 something happened. In an editorial from the combined Methodist Presbyterian newspaper, it was observed that it was a waste of time to keep some ministry students toiling away at mathematics. In that writer's opinion, the subject would be of no use to them whatsoever in their labours of ministry. The comment deserves thought. What's the evidence? At the time it seemed as if new ways of thinking theologically were to be initiated and therefore some of the traditional theological disciplines would have to go. Uh, Frederick Schleiermacher, sometimes called the father of modern Protestant theology, had written decades before about this need for a practical theology. Schleiermacher appealed to people to return to a faith based on a sense and a taste for the infinite. He didn't want theology to be burdened by excessive rationalism. But the crucial question was, where would the line be drawn? As the amateur clergy scientists began to see the professionalisation of science, the answer seemed clear. Natural philosophy, logic, mathematics were widely perceived as subjects for the secular curriculum alone. Those who wished to study them could do so at university, uh, hence the request to remove mathematics from the theological training seemed reasonable. To live under the geometry's golden sun is very exhilarating, and it keeps you on your toes and your faith very active. Fitchett, Dutton and Fairclough believed in what we might call the unique correspondence between mathematical truth and physical reality. But to many clergy, it was just a toil that took them away from their practical labours. Inexorably, the Presbyterian and Methodist churches were moving away from, from the direct engagement of faith with science and mathematics. And something of singular importance for Christian faith was lost. And next week we return to Erewhon to see what effect Darwin and the theory of evolution was having on the church. Thanks for watching.